So the malar descent we were talking about. So the main reason for formation and deepening of the under eye hollowness and the nasolabial fold is the malar descent. The main reason or the contributing reason uh, for formation or for deepening of the nasojugal groove and the formation of jowls is malar descent. And malar descent yeah. is happening because the zygomatico cutaneous ligament is getting down aligned because of the bone resorption of the zygoma. So to yeah. compensate for the effects of the bone resorption, we uh, deposit filler voluma over there. Yeah. So the purpose of depositing voluma on the zygoma is to realign the zygomatico cutaneous ligament. So which is why yeah. uh, dealing with under eye hollowness or nasolabial, jo, uh, nasolabial nasojugal and uh, jowls without dealing with cheek or realignment of the uh, zygomatico ZCL is not advised. That That is the mistake that we were doing earlier. We were directly injecting the lines. Yeah, getting it. Yeah. So which, which is why we were not getting natural results. People were not appreciating. People were not liking the filler uh, concept. But after so, now we yeah yeah please you were saying something yeah my my I was asking like like CK one and CK two are they working in the zygomatic cutaneous ligament yes. or they're working somewhere else CK yes. one and CK two CK one and CK two are the purpose of injecting these two points with voluma on the bone with bolus is to compensate the effects of the bone resorption of yeah. the zygoma, of the zygoma where the ZCL gets its attachment. Okay, the CK1, CK2 is working on this, this is zygomatic cutaneous only. Yes, yes, yes. Realignment yes. of FCL. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So loss and or ptosis of the SOOF is thought to contribute to the malar bags. Now the second contributor yes. is the ptosis of the SOOF or reduction of the SOOF. Yeah. Now, nowadays, because of lifestyle concerns, people are into weight loss, weight gain and so many other things, you know. Secondly, the age group that we are dealing for dermal fillers, that is mostly above 40s, right? Uh, they yeah. have metabolic concerns like diabetes or thyroid or maybe, uh, you know, uh, facial fat, fluid retention or some other hypertension. So that is the age group that's dealing with those concerns also. Yeah. Right. So sometimes the effect of these gets compensated. Sometimes it gets more yeah. aggravated. So we have to look yeah. at not just the anatomical concern, but we have to see the lifestyle concern also, which is contributing to the formation or compensation of a particular aesthetic concern. Yeah. So inferior descent of the SOOF and SMAS contributes to the exposure of the inferior orbital rim, right? And because of which we uh, we it is perceived as under eye hollowness. And how under eye hollowness impacts the lifestyle is people looking start looking tired. Right. So most of them, they will be able to resonate when, uh, you know, when you tell them that uh, uh, people are telling you that you always look tired or sad or gloomy or sleepy, even when you're not feeling the same, you're feeling happy, but you're looking sad. So yeah. this uh, psychological or emotional disparity is one of a pressing concern that aesthetic individuals will share with you at some point or the other, maybe not in the beginning because they themselves don't know how to um, uh, reciprocate their uh, concerns. Yeah. So, in this case, what I'm saying is, SOOF descent is linked more with orbitomalar ligament. Yeah. Is it orbitomalar ligament a part of zygomatic cutaneous ligament or is it just close to zygomatic cutaneous ligament? No. The Till the mid pupillary line, it is the zygomatic cutaneous ligament and medial to the mid pupillary line, it turns into the uh, uh, teardrop ligament. And above that, when it goes to yeah. the orbital rim like this, then it is the orbital retaining uh, ligament. So all these are connected also. So in this aspect where we see this area, it is mostly the zygomatic cutaneous ligament. Then it does like in this, yeah, yeah. In this diagram, the green ligament that they're showing is like orbitomalar ligament. Yeah, and in relation to this, where is uh, the it's zygomatic it's cutaneous? This is referred to the CL. It is same. Yeah, it's the same. Zagomatic and zygomatic cutaneous are same. Just yeah, it has many names. names actually. When you see the uh, papers, yeah. zygomatic cutaneous ligament is referred by many names. Okay, so it is same like zygomatic cutaneous yeah. ligament. Yeah. This yeah. orbitomalar. Right, right. Okay, yeah. 
so a double convexity may occur in severe cases and consist of this so uh, sometimes we see that there are two bulges under the eye yeah the superior convexity which is the prolapsed orbital fat the concavity caused by a defined inferior orbital rim and then there is an inferior convexity which is by the malar round mount yeah. yeah sometimes then laterally this is all medially then laterally over the zygomatic eminence we have the uh, festoon or the malar mound and yeah. then there is the indian band you know so the periorbital area is very complex you know sometimes it gets very complex yeah so sagging of soft tissues with aging will cause deepening of the nasolabial fold this we have discussed the forward and downward descent is contributing to the deepening of the nasolabial fold the nasojugal right so downward and forward descent of the skin and malar fat pad bulges against the fixed nasolabial fold causing them to deepen now why is the nasolabial fold deepening now they say that there is the tissue structure uh, of the skin in the periorbital area is different like the tissue is compact tissue structure is compact in the periorbital area as compared to the cheek so which is why yeah. there is no there is no ligament over here in nasolabial which is obstructing the forward descent it is the tissue difference in the tissue organization which is disrupting the forward descent like why we say that nasolabial fold gets deepened but why doesn't the fat come into the more medially into the you know peri yeah. peri uh, orbital area sorry periocular area right yeah that is because of the difference in the tissue organization as such they yeah. are physically obstructing stuff over here it is okay the shoe organization that this is more loose and this is more tightly compact yeah so uh, the displacement results from volume loss within the deep medial cheek fat pad degenerative loss of elastin in fascia and skin and weakening of the supporting septa extending from smash into the dermis yeah yeah so there is a loss in the deep fat there is a, there is some change in the skin the skin is losing its um... Uh, integrity collagen and, i think yeah, and yeah. elastin collagen yes, mass is becoming weakened yeah yeah so the skin changes the changes like in the dermal the dermal epidermal changes they are manifested as fine lines and wrinkles fine lines right? okay the we use skin boosters we use skin boosters for that yes skin boosters prp uh, now they have uh, profilo and all that uh, you know um other stuff so that is basically yeah. imp for improvement of the quality of the skin yeah i'm getting it so yeah. when we when we talk about aging of face there are two aspects one are the skin changes and one are the face changes yeah so like for the volume loss in the deep deep fat pad we are giving like boluses uh, I, I don't think we're doing much about this weakening of the supporting septa from the smas to oh, dermis the we can't do much we can't do much about it yeah fine so yeah. and for the skin use huh. we have to so that is whenever we're giving fillers we must work on the skin also like giving them prp or boosters yes that should be part of our uh, protocol or yes. at least so, we should advise them that we are working deep down but we are we can't we, we are not a, for making a change in the skin we need something else right exactly so which is why they say that uh uh you have to understand your client now three four categories this i am getting a little into selling part is it okay for you yeah 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 that's okay so this is relevant over here so types of clients you have to identify one is uh, educated doctors and uh, you know uh, scientifically driven and they collect lot of knowledge and information one category is that the second category is doctor you do whatever you want to do i am fine with it right then third category is that Uh, we will not do injectables uh, but uh, we are okay with anything you can do you you give us home application or with you know machines or all that so this is a third category so when we talk about yeah. third category so if the first category is there educated scientific person you can explain all this types of aging and skin and face and all that you know and then yeah. you ask them where do you want to start with first what is the most pressing concern what is max what is bothering you maximum that is where you start from because you can't do everything in one day you have to start Got from it. one concern and you have to ask what is the most pressing concern and that's where you begin with 
Right. Yes. The third is a doctor, whatever you do is fine with me. Hmm? So then there yeah. you start with skin surface procedures and not one. Yeah. Third client is I don't want injectables. Yeah. There you start with uh, you know, form of radio frequency and all that. Then yes. gradually you push them into PRP with a roller or a derma pen. Yeah. And after a few sessions of PRP, you can uh, propose them that it can be injected also. Yes. And then when yeah. they're okay to inject, because when they see the results with the, uh, you know, topical PRP, uh, they're yeah. motivated to, you know, get into more. Got it. So uh, when you Are you using Tharmaj or Haifu? In your practice, or you're just no, into fillers? No, I'm or not a very good. Uh, I I don't uh, like thermage and hypo. Rather, I would go for uh, radio frequency because uh, thermage and hypo are good for you know long term. Because hypo today I do a session, the and results I see after you know three months or maybe you know or two months. What is the point? Got it. So client retention for hypo per se is not good. I yeah, can... we are facing this problem. I have HIFU and the results are not good. Mm -hmm. So because people are paying me... for it and they want to see something instantly. Today's generation, you have to understand. It is a very, you know, a very instant kind of a generation. So what are you using for RF? Which machine are you using for I RF? Forma by InMode. Acha, acha, InMode, Morpheus. Yeah, Morpheus and Forma. So they give instant results. So, achha, I know about Morpheus. Pharma is something different so from the Morpheus. It's a, in mode is the same platform. In the same in mode uh, platform, I have Morpheus, I have Pharma, and I have Dialase XL, and I have Lumeka IPL. Okay, okay, got it. Um, nice. I have designed my treatments in a way that if someone is paying me some amount, they see the worth of it in another ne the, the following next week. Now, if you have HIFU, so what I would suggest is that, uh, you know, you can give someone a six packages of high, uh, six package, six uh, sessions of uh, PRP, and in that accommodate one session of high food. So the yeah. uh, you know the person is getting the result also, and they don't know what is giving what results. But you know that after three months they will be appreciated. So by the end of three months the PRP sessions will be over, or maybe there will be three PRP sessions done. After three, uh, you know, first do HIFU, then first do one PRP, then HIFU, then uh, PR followed by PRPs. So that by the end of the package, they have good result. Because by uh, that And you are happy with the results of InMode? Are you, are you happy with yeah, the results yeah, of InMode? Yeah. Okay. Nice. So some treatments which give delayed results that you have to quietly accommodate within the treatments which are giving slightly, slim, uh, you know, because only if you sell haifu it is the patient the person is going to go you won't be able to repeat. yeah they are not happy yeah we are facing this problem yes. actually i'm facing that because i have high that you have to make yeah got it right so yeah so slightly that is some uh, you know i have individuals i've had individuals who were very biased for injectables so what i started for them was uh, rf then gradually prp then gradually i told them that with PRP, if I inject with PRP, you are getting this good results. Now, if I start injecting, you will get even better results. So what I do, yeah. I start with PRP, I start injecting skin boosters. Yes. And once they are but... okay and comfortable with injectables, you can do filler, volume or anything. anything. If the, it is the idea to help them overcome the fear of needles. Yeah, getting it. Starting with PRP, then to skin boosters, and then to fillers. Yes, yes, yes. And they will be they you will be able to retain them for long because they are seeing the results in every session. I think th uh, this uh, RF would be working on this fibrous septa, maybe improving them to an extent level, not like... very deep to address that. I add Morpheus, so I combine for my Morpheus session into one. If I have to, uh, you know, give a deep bulking or slimming facial slimming or toning effect. I add Morpheus because Morpheus it will is going uh, to four mm depth on face. And Pharma is superficial. Pharma is superficial, you know, it's skin quality, it's epidermal. More for skin quality. Okay. More for skin quality. Yeah. 
so if i have exactly. to give a good matlab depending upon the client if i feel that for morpheus is also required so i combine for my morpheus so they get good results so when they are getting good results i give them another because you know aesthetic clients the problem with them is that uh, after four sessions they will ask is there anything new <laughs> do you yeah. have something new do you have something better yeah got it so yeah. you have to just they will they will keep coming to you provided you keep giving them results yes yeah yeah That's which they yeah. can perceive in the mirror from the next day onwards yeah yeah uh, it makes sense yes so according to your the area that you are practicing according to the individuals client types of people uh, surrounding you have to design your strategies and according to uh, the equipments you have you have to design your strategies in your setup yeah i i can understand this here yeah. so then when we go into the anatomy of the periorbital uh, features they are most scrutinized of the face obviously when we are talking to someone when we are looking at ourselves in a zoom meeting or when we are looking at ourselves in the mirror it is a mostly the periorbital area that we are uh, looking at the upper face is it is the aesthetic center of the face uh, it is the area where we do the estimate age also we can uh, you know estimate we can judge the emotional state of the person psychological state of the person then right? so the yeah. periorbital region is one of the uh, first one to show the signs and effects of aging so i'm doing a series on the eyes and the periorbital region on youtube every week i'm putting one video and it is uh, dealing so you, i hope uh, you're watching or maybe if you're not then you can you know uh, no I'll, i'll go through your series I, i'll look into them yeah so in that i yeah i started the, the on eyes in periorbital region because you know in these meetings there are very few things which i can share you know yeah, i'll I, go through your youtube channel yeah i'll go through your channel so you'll get a lot of insights into it now the periorbital yes. region shows the earliest signs of aging we know that there are so many reasons which we know uh, firstly the skin is very thin over here secondly the underlying maxilla is your supporting maxilla is going maximum changes and thirdly we are seeing ourselves you know in that central area so there could be genetics there is fa repetitive facial expression there are bone changes atrophy of dermis and soft tissues there is gravity intrinsic factors and all other extrinsic factors so the skin around the orbital is, orbital area is very it is the thinnest in the face and in general the facial skin is thinner in the upper face compared to the lower face and during aging the skin thickness increases in the forehead and cheeks but decreases in the infraorbital area so this is uh, something that we have to know that the skin increases the thickness or increases in the forehead and the cheeks that is what they say it is not the skin thickness basically it is uh, uh, the changes in the muscular structure be yeah i went through a paper in which they were saying that it is a muscle muscular structure that uh, or maybe the underlying bone you know that uh, supraorbital ridge becomes more prominent with age yeah so there are a few things in so repeated action of facial muscle over time leads to rightids this we will uh, this is more in uh, reference to botox now orbicularis oculi is the muscle responsible for crow's feet lines no it is not the muscle it is a skin mm -hmm. now what is happening is that the muscle is showing repeated action muscle obviously will undergo repeated actions the peculiar thing mm -hmm. about facial muscle expression facial muscles of expression is that their uh, uh, you know origin is from the bone but insertion is into the dermis yeah so which is why when the muscle is contracting the overlying skin is contracting yeah hai na but with age the collagen and elastin in the skin is reducing which is why it is not able to bounce back to its normal position after the muscle has relaxed yeah right so the orbicularis oculi obviously the formation of the wrinkles is because of the muscle action but the main cause of formation of wrinkles is the loss of elasticity of the collagen and elastin in the skin yeah so when we are doing botox for crow's feet suppose so it is only one aspect that we are catering to Dealing. the muscular aspect yeah. what, what about the skin structure so are we doing prp in that area for collagen induction are we putting any skin boosters over there for collagen induction if we add these two procedures then is we are you know dealing with the concern in totality uh, 
My question regarding skin boosters are: Are they just hyaluronic acid, or they got something to really increase collagen or boost uh, collagen? Or they just hyaluronic acid. Acid. Yeah. They are basically hyaluronic acid, but they say uh, some studies have mentioned that when the uh, uh, HA is uh, put into skin, there is a cascading effect on the collagen as well. Okay. Right, but there's a very very few evidence of that. Right, but uh, that is why I'm saying that PRP and hyaluronic. Okay, yeah. Collagen so we don't have boosters yet which can directly stimulate collagen like yeah, certain compounds. I think Profilo and all, but India, I don't think they have. In India, it's not. But so. India, we don't have. Profilo is not available in India? No, it is available, but uh, the results are not very satisfactory, you know, as compared to skin boosters. See, hydration will give the maximum results. Okay, Vital and this. All yes, those. Vital and uh, what we say is uh, Volite. Volite, huh? Volite, yeah, Allergan. Yeah. Volite. Now, Profilo was introduced for, okay, it is a pro good product, but as compared to Vital and uh, Volite, uh, the problem is pro with Profilo is that it has delayed results. It is ex much, much expensive uh, as compared to these two. And uh, it is mostly meant for beginner injectors who are not confident injecting Vital and Volite on the entire face. So the only five points, it's very easy for them. Okay. Right. Uh, I, I, in my practice, I find Volite and these two more gratifying. You know. At the end, your client Volite is happy. Okay. So that is my major, like when you start practicing in your own clinic, you become client oriented. You know, when I That's was right. in CC, I was like, okay, we are injecting whatever is coming. We are injecting, you know, we are doing yeah. the yeah. With one ML, two ML, three ML, whatever. But uh, when in own setup, it is always client oriented. Yeah. They have to give you a good, uh, uh, call after two three days. Okay, doctor, you've done something good for me. So, the... got it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, most welcome. The orbicularis ocula is a muscle responsible for crow's feet uh, lines. It controls blinking, squinting, forceful eye closure. Different branches of facial nerve innervate the upper and lower eyelids, and the muscle is split into orbital, palpable, lacrimal components. So. This is more in relevance for Botox, but still, if it is there, then just go through it. Orbital part, it will close the uh, eyelids firmly, but uh, volunt by voluntary action. Palpable is gently in involuntary or reflex blinking, and lacrimal is compresses the lacrimal sac, which receives tears from the lacrimal ducts. These are the retaining ligaments, anchoring and stabilizing the skin and fascia. Right. So uh, first, we have the teardrop ligament here medially. Yeah. Then it uh, goes up and above. We have the orbicularis lig ligament. Then below it, we have the zygomatico. This is the zygomatico cutaneous ligament, the dotted line. Yeah. You call it by whatever name you want to call it. But this is a ligament that is starting from here and going till here. Right. Then we have superior temporal. These are the four ligaments may, uh, which we are addressing when we are doing dermal fillers in the mid face. Yeah. Right? So, subcutaneous facial fat exists in distinct anatomical apartments. Now, uh, superior orbital compartment is there, inferior orbital compartment, medial cheek compartment, and lateral orbital compartment. So uh, to demarcate and to make the uh, marking uh, points for our injections, we have those uh, hindrance line. Yeah. Hindrance line will defy, uh, uh, divide the entire cheek area into four quadrants. So when we come to the injection aspect of it, then we will be considering all those. How to do the marking on the face for injections. Yes. So these are arbit. Uh, I think I know hinders line, but I think they are not based on any anatomical ligament or anything no, no, like no. that. No, no, no. surface marking. They are just surface, surface marking. Mark. Fine. And our facial muscles are concealed by subcutaneous fullness in youth. Uh, during aging, significant loss of subcutaneous volume accentuates the underlying bone and muscle structures. Right. So skin changes will further uh, add to or contribute to the 
all the aesthetic concerns which are arising because of the underlying changes in the morphology, in the anatomy. Yeah. So aging effects are the periorbital skeleton, reducing the soft tissue support under the eyes. So orbital yeah. septum width, width and volume, it's significant recession manifesting in middle age uh, in males. And this is important. Like in women, it uh, manifests as a later age as compared to men. The uh, orbital aperture width and volume. The infralateral aspect of the orbital rib, the significant recession manifesting in middle age. The supramedial quadrant of orbital rim, significant recession manifesting in old age. Right Here they say it is manifesting in old age, but old. Uh, I have seen individuals, women uh, with the bone recession who have, you know, low calcium and all those vitamin D deficiencies and all that. Uh, in those, uh, the recession, supramedial recession, they are worried about their medial brow descent. You know, they're always asking, ki, can you do this? Yeah. So that is an indication that the underlying bone or the A-line deformity that comes below the brow, that these are the concerns arising because of uh, the supramedial uh, recession. Right? Yeah. Now, inframedial quadrant of orbital rim, recession more pronounced in males manifesting in old age. See, whatever time it manifests, you know, it is not the area. The person is coming to you and you have to uh, assess what all are the underlying changes that could be contributing to this concern. So yeah. it could be the infralateral aspect, it could be supramedial or infromedial. So the infralateral and infromedial uh, recession would cause, uh, 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 it would cause this uh, puffiness of eyes or what would it cause? It would cause... Uh... Oh, puffiness is because of the uh, two reasons. Puffiness is one is the fat... Uh, prolapse which is perceived as yeah. puffiness and the other uh, is because of the fluid retention because of some okay. medical concern right so what does this cause what this recession what will the recession of inferior lateral and medial inframedial uh, rim medial cause? will be deepening of the uh, hollowness deepening of the hollowness okay, okay. and infralateral will be uh, pronounced malar mound infralateral would be uh, you know, pressing the structures overlying, which will reduce uh, the fluid inflow or the lymphatic flow, which will end up in fluid retention and which will cause the malar mound. Malar mound. Yeah. Yeah. So eyebrows exhibit a flatter configuration with aging. So that we all know in men, as it is, the eyebrows are flat. But in women, uh, eyebrows are a major concern because they, from arched, they become flatter with age because of the all the underlying changes. They become the eyebrows become flat. There is an upper eyelid hooding because of the prolapse of the uh, fat pads. So lateral blau ptosis may occur. Uh, retro orbital roof determines volume and mobility of the lateral eyelid. Yeah. Right. So that is why periorbital region is very complex. It has maximum number of aesthetic concerns which are bothering people, individuals, especially women. Yeah. Now the people have, uh, they develop their own uh, uh, ways to deal with the aesthetic concerns. Like uh, if there is a brow descent, so brow descent yeah. is uh, what all what are the contributions I mean what are structures are contributing to brow descent so it could be the uh, bone recession in the frontalis sorry bone recession in the uh, front bone it yeah. could be muscular uh, you know degeneration slight uh, laxity muscle laxity it could be yeah. uh, temporal hollowness yeah it could be a prolapse of the uh, roof yeah right uh, so these are all the contributing factors of how do people compensate with it? They start uh, lifting it. They become like this, you know, they start, uh, they become hyperkinetic. Yeah. So many women in the age of 50 to 55, you would see that already they have a V-shaped, you know, without any Botox, without any procedure, they have a, the brow becomes V-shaped. Up, okay. up 
that is because they're in the habit of lifting it because all this descent is interfering with the visual field. Yeah. They have developed this compensatory uh, habit of lifting their brows and they're now always like this. So there you yeah. can uh, advise Botox because the moment you do Botox, it'll come down and again, they'll have problems with visual field. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, let's try this. So eyebrow fat volume increases with age. It is not the volume which is increasing. It is a projection. You know, it is getting prolapsed outwards, which is perceived as it is increasing. So this is a 21-year-old female and this is 76-year-old. This is how the fat pad prolapse and all that happens. Major component of eyebrow volume is soft tissue and muscle. And 18% of the eyebrow volume consists of fat. And uh, here, the decrease in soft tissue and there is decrease in muscle volume, significant increase in the galial fat pad and 81% of the eyebrow volume consists of fat because all the other structures have receded. It is not that fat yes. has increased, it has prolapsed and other structures have receded. So percentage of contribution to the concern is 81% now. Yeah. Eyelid muscles lose their strength and tone causing eyelid ptosis. Because the strength and tone is lost, that is why it, everything comes forward. Because underlying there is a thick uh, ligament, it cannot go down. So it juts out. It protrudes forward. Yeah. So it takes a path of least resistance and that is why you form the under eye bags and all that. So orbicularis oculi muscle responsible for lid closure, levator papillary by responsible lid elevation, tarsal plate gives the upper eyelid its shape and mechanical strength. This is over time, yeah. eyelid muscles gradually lose their strength and tone, and normal orbital fat prolapses forward, and brow ptosis and dermatochelesis may be associated with eyelid ptosis. So along with eyelid ptosis, there would be brow ptosis also. Yeah. Brow ptosis is more common as compared to lid ptosis. Yeah, uh, dermatochelasia is, uh, what is dermatochelasia? Brow uh, ptosis, I can understand. Uh, changes in the skin uh, uh, structure, all those skin changes basically. Oh. Eyelid ptosis, I can understand. Brow ptosis, yes. Eyebrow? Yeah. Besides the ptosis, eyebrow has many other changes. There's loss of hair, loss of density of the hair, loss yeah. of arch. There's medial brow ptosis and lateral brow ptosis. When we talk about brow rejuvenation, it's mostly the lateral brow that we are uh, addressing with the injectables. The medial brow as such, we do not have much to do. We cannot do yeah. much here. Yeah. So these are crow's feet. This is in relevance with the Botox. So volume loss is a predominant cause of theater of de deformity. Yes. So they say volume loss, but it is also the bone resorption. So volume loss means volume loss in the fat pads also and volume loss uh, with respect to bone. It is a total volume. Yeah. So theater of deformity is a hollow ridge below the eye, which results in a fatigued appearance. So people look tired, you know. They're feeling fresh. They have slept well, but still they are looking tired and people are always telling them that you're looking tired and they just can't figure out that what's wrong. Yeah. So whenever you see a, an individual with the Andrei hollowness and they are, you know, aesthetically inclined, if you ask them that people uh, say they will uh, quickly resonate with you. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. The underlying cause of tear drugs can be multifactorial, volume loss, skin laxity and all that. And in some patients, there are dark circles also. So when there are dark circles, uh, it further complicates the under eye hollowness. So you don't know. Uh, and the dark circles, the reason could be venous pooling, pigmentation, changes in thin kissness or any other kind of pigmentation. So that is what they say. Like if, if there is a periorbital region, under eye region, there is hollowness also and dark circles also. What will you treat first? Because if you treat pigmentation, obviously we know that pigmentation, we are not going to end up in a good place. You know, They will keep spending money and they will not get satisfactory results. So, And hollowness as it is. So what will you treat first? 
I would say hollowness. But when you treat hollowness, the pigmentation becomes more prominent. Yeah. Put filler, the pigmentation becomes more prominent. So now you have to explain all this in advance. So what you can do is start with under eye dark circles, make a treatment uh, plan in which first two sessions are, or make it make it a lifestyle under eye creams and all that. And then in middle, you do the uh, filler and then further contribute uh, four to five sessions of dark circles. So make it a package. We cannot uh, like, you know, scientifically when we are talking, then we are talking differently. But when we are, uh, you know, client perspective, when we are talking to clients and when we are designing for individuals who are, you know, so you have to think like them. Yeah. So there are three reasons for this under eye. One is the hollowness. Mm -hmm. The the second is the pigmentation. And third is the venous uh, congestion also and then prominent veins also. Prominent. What we call subcutaneous venous pooling. Yeah. So yeah. for... Uh, for the hollowness, fillers can work. Yes. For pigmentation, we have to use like creams, under eye creams. And under eye creams and peels, peels, arginine peels and all that. And arginine. iron levels and all, all those things. The pigmentation and also, keep blue pigmentation or brown pigmentation. So bluish is because of the pooling, and yeah. brown is melanin. What will you do for the venous congestion or venous pooling? We can't do much about it or we can do something about it. Yeah, we can do RF helps in venous pooling. Radio right. frequency will help. Uh, tell them home care, uh, massage and ice cooling and all those things. You have to tell them it ice is cooling. Venous pooling. And then, then uh, at home also they can do a few things. Make it a practice. And uh, uh, otherwise also uh, RF frequency. That is why I'm saying I'm a very good fan of RF because it helps me deal with all these concerns which are otherwise very difficult. Yeah, RF can help. I think blood vessels to shrink yeah. or coagulate yeah. or I don't know. Some way it will work. Increase. The uh, you find arginine peels are good for these under eye pigmentation? If you find what works? it is because of melanin, like yeah. brown pigment, then arginine peels will work. And which topical works best with you? Which company topical for under eye especially? I usually find vitamin C or maximum kojic acid. I don't give anything, you know, aggressive because under eye area, if you give something aggressive, it will start peeling. There will be irritation because all the aesthetic clients, no matter what type of skin they have, it is always sensitive. Okay. There is no specific product that you recommend, like which you find good for under eye. Like there are a lot of companies. There are, but there you know, I haven't been able to, you know, con I'm not convinced with the results. Fine. So any 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 vitamin C or kojic will do. Yeah. And yeah. vitamin C and kojic, hyaluronic. If there are fine yeah. lines also, there is there is darkness and there are fine lines. Then add hyaluronic acid, hyaluronic acid serum also. Yes. Fine. Four percent? Use four percent serums. One point two percent. If you four percent is there, I don't know if four percent is there, but one point two percent are there. Four percent is also there. Is it oil based? Starting one percent. There are certain. Um, I got one four percent uh, available. Uh, Hyalura, Hyalura is one. The few four percent available. Recently, there's a effort top. Effort top is another product which has come with four percent hyaluronic acid. Okay. Okay. So it has to be a serum. Uh, if it is good, 4% is also good enough and it will give good results. But again, the other is uh, whatever you prescribe, try using it first. Because when I started using hyaluronic 1.5%, the first time I applied it. So after two days, I felt heavy over here.